Good morning. As we get into God's Word today, I want to share a quick card uh, with you and just a short snapshot of one of the ministries that we have here at the First Christian Church. This is a, a thank you card that we received this past week, and it reads, Dear Mike and Congregation, Thank you for your love and support of the college students. Our daughter enjoys spending, uh, attending your worship services. A special thank you to, to all who provided Sunday's meal. Uh, we enjoyed it in the fellowship. God bless you all uh, in love, a Christian family. Uh, and that's cool. I'm excited about that. You have done a great job, First Christian Church of Waynesburg. We had no idea what we were getting into last July, but we are, we are very pleased. We're very excited to be here. And, uh, and I'm excited to see the unique calling that this church has. Jason, I'm going to quote you a hundred times on this. Uh, when our kids go to college, my prayer is that, well, hopefully they go to a Bible college. But if they choose to go to state school, uh, hopefully there's a church behind that college that can reach out to them and encourage them. And that's one of the unique callings that we have here as the First Christian Church of Waynesburg is to reach out to the young students there, to the faculty there, and to show them the love of Jesus Christ. And quick snapshot, on Monday nights, that's when we have the college small group at our house. And every Monday night, there's a handful of them, 10 to 19, that truck over there to our house, to the parsonage. And uh, they invade our house, they eat all our food, they chase my kids through the house, it, and it's a blast. It's a good time. But we start at 6 o'clock, have some time where we share about our lives, and then we have at least a good hour, hour and 15. They discuss, they argue, they, they critique, they think, they analyze, and they read God's Word. And then after that's done, then we go outside and we play Ultimate Frisbee in the road. Uh, but it is a good time, and the young people are learning about Jesus Christ. So thank you for supporting them. Thank you for encouraging them. Let's pray as we get into God's Word today. God, we thank you for uh, using us. We thank you for using us for your kingdom. We thank you for entrusting us with the young lives of, of infants, of, of toddlers, of elementary students, of junior high and, and in high school and college and, and 20-somethings and 30s and the wise crowd. God, we praise you that we can, we can do ministry, share your love with people of all ages, of all backgrounds. God, I pray that today as we study your word that you can encourage us to live lives that are faithful to you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So in the evenings, we gather the, the family together and we get the kids on the couch or wherever we may find them, and, and we get together and we read our Bible story. And, and this is something that they've always done. They always, whenever you're reading to them, they want one arm around one kid and the other arm around the other kid, okay? Now, that worked really well when they were smaller, but as they grow, the books don't grow, and so every time I go to turn a page, I'm like, eh, and their heads are bouncing anyway. Anyways, so I got Joseph on this side, Anna on this side, mom's over here, and, and we're working our way through this Bible. Now, I don't understand why, but when we first had our kids, everybody thought that we needed Bibles. So like we got tons of baby Bibles and beginner Bibles, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm a preacher. Did you not think that maybe I'd buy my own kids? Or anyway, so we've got tons of different beginners Bibles, and so we're working our way through this one. And uh, the other night, I'm reading, and it says Joshua and the spies. I'm thinking, all right, so Joshua and Jericho, no problem. Let's see how this story unfolds, because usually they go through the story, and then at the end, there's some moral truth that we should learn from it. David and Goliath. Okay, so we trust in God; we can do big things. So I'm reading Joshua and the spies, and I'm going to read you page 129. Still, two spies found a way into the city. They went to Rahab's house. At that point, I'm like, whoa. They went to Rahab's house. And if you know the story, Rahab has an interesting occupation. Let's just put it there. She's a woman of ill pursuit. And I'm thinking, how is this story going to end? And then what happens is Rahab, the spies, come to Rahab, and they say, hey, can you hide us in your roof? So she hides them in the roof. Then the army guards come in, and they say, where are the spies? And she says, oh, they left. You can find them if you go that way. So we have a prostitute that's lying, and that's our Bible story for tonight. I'm thinking, great, where is this going to go? Anyways, it, it went well, and the, the moral of the story that we found, that, that, that I believe that story is telling, is that God can use anybody. God can use you. Even if you come from a sinful background, the, through redemption, God can use you. 
But there are some stories in the Bible that I think maybe we need to hold off for a couple years. I don't think they're totally ready to find out all about Rahab. It didn't say anything about her occupation in here. That was good. I was glad about that. But there are some stories in the Bible that maybe we need to hold off for a couple years. If you've got your Bible, open it up. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. If you've got a church Bible, it's on page six, uh, 261. 261. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Uh, this is one of those stories. This is one of those stories that when I was a kid and I read it, I thought, this is cool. I'm not reading this one to Joseph. It's going to be a while before I share this one with him. Second Samuel chapter 23. Real quick, here's a pop quiz. Who is the first king of Israel? Saul. Now, that's a trick question because you got it right because Saul is the first people king. God was the first king. See, technically. So it's a trick question. Yeah. You got it, though. Saul is the first people king. Second people king was David. Excellent. So we got Saul, then David. Uh, now, David, one of his responsibilities... Uh, hey, John, I'm getting a lot of feedback. One of his responsibilities uh, was to finish what Joshua started. When they moved the Israelites into the land of Canaan, David's responsibility and Joshua's responsibility was to drive out the foreign nations that were there to get rid of them, to cleanse the land so that the Israelites could come in and set up camp and live there peacefully without distractions, okay? And so what we see here in 2 Samuel chapter 23 is a list of people that fought with David. They're called his mighty men. These are guys who, who listened to what God told them to do to drive the four nations out, and they did it very well. And I remember the first time as a child I read this, I thought, this is impressive stuff. Let's look at chapter 23, starting verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty men. Joshab, Bashebeth, a, a Tekimonite, was chief of the three. Now, don't get trapped in the big, long names that I can't pronounce and you can't pronounce. Just listen to this. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. That's a lot of people. 800. That's his count. Keep going. Verse 9. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, uh, the Ahonite. Uh, as one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at past them in uh, for battle. Then the men of Israel retreated, so they leave Eleazar there. But he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. What does that look like? What does it look like for your hand? This is some questions that I have when I get to heaven. This is pretty cool. Again, something I'm not sharing with Joseph because I don't want... Anyway, keep going. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Herite. When the Philistines banded together at a place there was a, uh, where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled them. But Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Two guys where the army def just, just deserts him, but they stand their ground. They say, God has called us to stay here, and we're going to stand our ground, and we're going to fight. And fight they did. Keep going. Verse 13. During the harvest time, three of the uh, 30 chief came down uh, to help David at the cave of Ad Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, at that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. Uh, David longed for water, and he said, Oh, that someone might get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Uh, Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. So these three guys break through enemy lines just to get their commander a drink of the good water. These guys are tough. They can do things that most Navy SEALs dream about doing. Keep going. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Verse 18, Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zeru, was the chief of three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? He became their commander, even though he was not included among them. Then this guy, Benai, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter of Kezbel, who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He struck down a huge Egyptian 
Well, we read in 1 Chronicles, this guy is seven and a half feet tall that he fights. You think I'm tall? Seven and a half feet. That's an extra 14, 15 inches. That's a big guy. Struck down this huge Egyptian. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand. Ben I went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benai, son of Jehoiada. He too was a famous, as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in great honor, uh, greater honor than any of the thirty. But he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. And from here through the rest of the chapter is the list of the rest of the mighty fighting men. These guys are impressive. These guys did some pretty, pretty amazing things. God called them to fight. And that's what they did. And they did it well. That was what God called them to do. Now, right now, I don't want any of you to like stop and check out and think, God called me to fight my neighbor. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. There's a lot of background here. If you've got your Bibles, turn back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because that background of why God called the Israelites to drive out these four nations. Deuteronomy chapter 7. See, God didn't say, I, I want you valiant warriors to just go killing people. There was a reason behind it. There was a reason that the Israelites were driving out these foreign nations. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering uh, to possess and drives out before you the nations, the Hittites, Gergeshites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. That's it. Plain, simple. Get rid of all of them. That was God's command. That was what they were to do. As the Israelites moved from, from being in slavery in Exodus uh, in, in, in Egypt, as they moved into the wilderness, wandered for 40 years, finally got their act together and went into the promised land, God says, when you get there, I want you to drive out all the foreign nations. I get rid of all the people. And this is why. This is why. Read verse 3. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will, listen to this, for they will turn your sons away from following me, away from following God, to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So the reason that they're not to uh, have any part with these, these, these foreign nations is because they will turn their heart away from God. It's to protect the people. Uh, keep going here. That's uh, verse, verse 4. Uh, For they will turn your sons away from me to following, to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Verse 5. This is what you're to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down the ashram poles, and burn their idols in the fire. These are idolatry practices. And God says, get rid of them. You can't have them because you have to drive them out to protect yourself. To protect yourself. John, that's the next slide to protect yourself. And so that's what they're called to do. Now, along to that, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4 through 6. Chapter 9, verse 4, says this. There's, there's two reasons. One is to drive the nations out because if they stay, they'll tempt the Israelites. The Israelites will fall into sin and mess everything up. Verse 4, chapter 9, verse 4. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, the Lord has, uh, it is not on account of the wickedness, excuse me. Uh, no, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It's because of their sin. Their wickedness is why God is driving them out. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity, Israelites, that you are going in to take possession of the land, but on account, again, on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord is giving these people uh, because you're a stiff-necked people. He reminds the Israelites, hey, you're sinful too. You're pretty stubborn, pretty obnoxious. But these, these foreign nations, they've heard the truth. They've seen the truth. But they continue to live in sin. They continue to practice idolatry. They continue to... to uh, 
to, to, to live in uh, sexual immorality. They mix worship with sex, with temple prostitutes. They offer child sacrifices. These are rotten, awful people. And some will say, well, why does God have to destroy them? That's not fair. What's well, to protect the Israelites? It's because they're being punished for their sins. And on top of all that, they had the truth. They just didn't listen to it. Do you remember Rahab? The story from here. Rahab, she's found in Joshua, Joshua chapter 2. Rahab actually, she knows the truth. She knows the truth. And when God's people come to take out her city, she goes, hey, hey, I know who God is. And uh, can I be on your side? Because I know what God's going to do. This is what she says, Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. She says this, when we heard that you were coming to fight us, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of, uh, because of you. For the Lord, your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. That's a confession of faith. She goes, God is God, and I want to be on your side. I want to follow Yahweh, the God of the Bible. So Rahab found out about it. Why didn't the rest of the nation? Because they didn't want to. Because they were stubbornly attached to their sin. And so God called the Israelites, God called David's mighty men to come through and to wipe out these nations. That was the calling of the mighty men. They were called by God to fight. That's what they did, and they did it well. We have a different calling. Our calling is not to drive out annoying neighbors as much as we'd like to. Okay? Our calling is to lead righteous lives and fight against sin. Men, we have a calling today to live righteous lives, to lead righteous lives and fight against sin. But this is, this is what I believe a lot of guys are doing today. So I was reading through the, uh, the resolution book. I shared a story about this. It's a, name, a man named Jack and his wife, Shara, Sarah. Jack and Sarah. And, and Jack is driving his minivan. Okay, so he's driving his van. Sarah's sitting here in the passenger seat. And Jack's driving the van. They got the three kids in the back, all right? So they're doing a little family trip going down the road. And Jack's doing this. Anybody do that before? Anybody? Anybody hit anything? I've hit stuff. You fall asleep, you hit a guardrail, you're like, I'm awake, and your eyes are all like, you're trying to roll the window down, turn the radio up, whatever you can do to stay awake. Anyway, so Jack is doing the the nod thing, and, and next thing you know, he's out. He's gone. He's totally asleep. And as goes his sleeping, goes his driving. And so the van starts to swerve from the highway, crosses a couple lanes, his wife, who is awake, is freaking out. She does what any normal woman would do, reaches across, grabs the steering wheel, and pulls the van back to the right side of the highway with this, a very sharp, hey, wake up, pulls the van back to the other side of the highway. Husband wakes up, realizes he's sleeping, pulls the wheel back the other way. So now the van is doing one of these, getting some speed wobbles. And, and they're fighting back and forth. The wife and the husband are wrestling for the steering wheel. Everybody's going crazy. The kids are screaming because they're afraid for their life. Traffic is honking because they're thinking, what is this minivan doing? Finally, the dad realizes, I can stop this. It's underneath my feet. It's called the brake. He locks them up, brings the van to a screeching halt. And on the side of the road, there's a curve and a cliff and a guardrail. And they sit there. There's no blood left in his face at all. He's as white as a ghost. His wife is weeping. The kids are crying. And it hits him. It's his fault. It's his fault he almost just lost his family. I think that's an accurate portrayal of men today. God has put us in the driver's seat of our families. God has said, I called you to spiritual leadership. I called you to live righteously. I called you to fight against sin. I called you to love your wives, love your children, to lift them up, to lead them. And we fall asleep to our jobs. We fall asleep to being busy, to hobbies, to whatever it is. And we get distracted. And we just let it just go off to the side of the road. And it's our wives and our children 
that are going to suffer, and ourselves. And so what does this do to your family? Watch, this is what it does. Here is, here is the wife, okay? And she has to step out of her God-given responsibilities and now do her work and the husband's work. She reaches out. I think it's an accurate portrayal. She now has to do everything that she has to do, and she has to steer the family. That's not her job. That God has given that responsibility to us, to men, to fathers. But now she is doing both jobs, and it's not working well. All because dad wants to make more money, or dad wants to do whatever dad wants to do. And I think across America, men are sabotaging their own families because of whatever it is. I'm guilty. There are times when I, I drift off into wherever I'm at. My wife is going, hello, do you remember us? You, know, you loved us. I think you do. And I come to the Bible and I see the call that God has given me in my life to be the spiritual leader, to say no to the distracting things in the world. I could sit up here and read you facts and stats about father absence. I got tons of them. Numbers and numbers and numbers. There are 24 million children in America. There are 24 million children in America that do not live with their biological father at home. Let me say it this way. That means one out of three kids, one out of three kids does not have a biological father at home. When I served as a youth minister and I had different kids come into our youth group and I saw the stories of their lives, where they're from, what they grew up in. I scratch my head and I say, you're still sane? You're still semi-normal? How did you make it through that? Because when fathers leave, children become more likely to be poor, incarcerated, more likely to be criminals. Uh, teens without fathers are twice as likely to be involved in sexual activity, seven times more likely to become pregnant as adolescents. When the fathers leave, the families fall apart. Works with everything, child abuse, with drug and alcohol use, obesity, education. Single moms have more than tripled between 1960 and 2000. We have an epidemic here in America, in the world, with dads checking out, falling asleep. Moms are stepping up. Kudos to you moms who are stepping up and doing the work in the passenger seat and the driver's seat. You're fighting because there's no one left. But why don't we men, why don't we stand up and live courageously and say, this is, the, this is the fight that God has called us to live. This is what I'm going to do with my life. First, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to say no to the guy who's sleeping. I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm going to choose to grow myself. I'm going to choose to grow in Christ every day. I'm going to live a life that's marked by growth. See, the Christian walk is one that's a, about moving forward in our faith. And First Peter your pages get stuck in there sometimes, but that's okay. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. And so one of the things that we need to do as men is we need to grow in Christ. We need to be moving forward every day in our faith. That's the next slide, please. We need to be growing forward. We need loving Christ more and more in our lives. And it moves from from the immaturity to maturity. I like the way the, the Hebrews writer says. He says, you still need milk? Why aren't you eating solid food? Solid food is for the mature, but instead we're still going over the elementary truths. Dads, is our faith on the incline? Is it moving up? Have we hit a plateau? Are we declining? Are we eating baby food? Are we eating steak? Look at that. Turkey, rice, and garden vegetables. Ugh. Tender pieces for learning to chew. That's disgusting. You remember in the, uh, the Courageous movie where the dad, Nathan, he, he switches the yogurt and gets the, the, the baby food and he eats it? Oh, I would not eat that. That's, is that how we treat the elementary truths? We say, yeah, we're not there anymore. We're at the meat and potatoes. I don't know what that little foo-foo thing is on the side. You can eat that. I'm going to eat that good stuff. That's where we're at. We say we're men of the Lord. 
We're in our scriptures daily. We're on our knees praying to our Father in heaven every day. We're growing every day in our walk. Why? Because our family needs us to. We might even, we might even have to cut some time out where we say, okay, wife, kids, you just got to give me some time to spend in my scriptures because I got to get this going because when that goes up, then life in our family goes up. And so first off, we need to be growing in the Lord. Second, we need to be loving our wives, loving our wives. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the relationship between a husband and a wife. And again and again, Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. I think he says it three times because we don't get it the first time, so you got to keep repeating it. But he says, love your wives. This past week, I got to do a wedding for uh, Martha and Paul. And uh, I was surprised too. I didn't know it was going to happen on Tuesday night, but they got married on Tuesday night here. And it was encouraging to see their face. They're all excited and they're all newlywed and they're hugging and kissing. And wow, I, I think we've been married for eight years, seven, seven, Shh. for a long time. Uh, but has it changed? I mean, when we first got married in 2004, uh, and now, uh, has it changed? Are we still in love with our wives? Are we still pursuing a relationship with our wives, looking after them and loving them? So God says, this is your fight. Your fight is to grow yourself in loving Christ, to grow your relationship with your wife, loving your wives, and to love your children. God has entrusted you with kids. That's your responsibility. Are we nurturing? Are we loving them? Are we spending time with them? And not just time, but time and instruction and training. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. But it said, bring them up. Exasperate, that's a fancy word for annoy. That's a fancy word for provoke. Because raising kids is, is hard. You're, uh, I'm giving you advice. Mine are four and three. Yeah, right. You're looking at me and laughing. What do I know? It's difficult but we continue to go back and invest and invest. And it's not done. Look, don't look at me and say, well, our kids are growing out of the house. It's not done. They're still your kids. You're still loving on them. You're never done, okay? So we, we grow in our, our walk with Christ. We grow in our walk with our wives. We grow in our walk with our children. And last off, we love others. We love those around us. We're doing what God told us to do, what Jesus said. The most important thing is to love God and then love others. We grow in Christ, loving God, and then we love others, our wives, our children, and those around us. People say to me, I don't have time to love people around me. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to invest in other people. I don't have time. How can you not have time? I want to, I want, I want to help my children find out that it's not about them, but it's that it's about others. And so if I go out and I paint a house, that's not mine. I've served someone dinner that I don't even know. Our kids are watching. And they're going, that doesn't make sense. Huh, that must mean that people are important, that we love people, that we serve people. So that's our calling. That's what God's looked at us and said, men, I need you to step up courageously. I need you to love Christ, love your wives, your children, and then others. That's our calling. I will never stand in a field with a spear and smite 800 Philistines. I won't do that. My hand will not freeze to a sword. I'll not kill any lions or tigers or bears. It's not my calling. But I will serve my family. I will lead my family. And I will love my Savior. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you can encourage each man in this room to follow you to love you, love our wives, our children, and others. God, I pray that you will help us to step out courageously to take the wheel and lead our families. We thank you for giving us this opportunity. We pray that we can be faithful to it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.